Water White, Book One, Chapter Twenty Five. Let me go, Celeste shouted when she regained consciousness. Her head hurt and she was disoriented. Despite her keen vision, she had difficulty seeing what surrounded her in the dim, musty room. Something weighed her down upon the seat, though there were no restraints around her. Go where, dearie dear? A tiny old lady rested on a burgundy velvet armchair, worn yet elegant in the far corner. Her voice sounded like crumpling cellophane and hurt Celeste's ears. With great effort, Celeste rose and tried to run for the door, but she moved as if in a nightmare, barely able to pull each foot from invisible quicksand. Save your energies, girly, the woman commanded. You've been a baddy bad girl and we can't have that. Celeste rubbed her eyes with her silk scarf in an attempt to see more clearly, and when she finished, she saw a wave of blood zigzagging across the emerald green. Reaching to her head, she discovered the source of the blood. So this is how you keep everyone in line? By knocking them out and frightening them? Celeste challenged the old woman. Anger welled within her, but also fear. The force weighing her down was something she couldn't escape, and panic set in. She attempted to fly to the door, but her feet remained planted. Her heart raced. Only the willy willful ones need coaxing. The woman rose from her chair and seemed to float across, across the floor under a massive maroon cloak, too large for her minuscule frame. The sparse silver hair on the overleader's head swirled upward into a sharp point, and Celeste could barely see the woman's bird-like black eyes beneath her bushy eyebrows. High, chiseled cheekbones and a beak-like nose reminded Celeste of the last thing she remembered seeing. The shifter! Where is it? What have you done? Fear choked her. Chimney's wounds would be treated quickly and he'd be fed well, but who would care for Orville? She tried to reach him with her mind, but only silence throbbed in her aching head. Silly, silly speak, the woman scoffed. I know no shifter. The black vulture, you know what I'm talking about. It's been following me ever since... Ever since what, dearie dear? Celeste couldn't determine how much the overleader knew about her past and her powers. The old lady had abilities of her own more powerful, it seemed, than Celeste's, and it was in a position to hurt her friends. The overleader evidently commanded the shifter. Celeste wished she'd thought of a way to bring Thunder and his cubs with her when she had returned to the village. The people wouldn't have been so quick to surround her then. Movement against the wall behind the overleader's chair caught Celeste's attention, and when the old woman saw the look of horror on the girl's face, she cackled. Just let me go, Celeste demanded. Her eyes were glued to the enormous lizard slowly slithering along the far wall. It was longer than thunder. You've made your point. Now let me get back to my friend. Friend? You've just one friendy friend? asked the overleader, her voice mocking. No, my friends, let me get back to my friends. One needs me badly. Let me go, please. I'm not here to hurt anyone. But you did hurt them, girly. You and your freaky froggy. The boy almost died. The woman's voice was cold and harsh. Celeste shivered. We were just trying to help, she said, but even she knew that sending Orville off with Chimney had been a mistake. The lizard advanced, but as Celeste struggled fruitlessly toward the door, it inexplicably backed off. So what happens now? Now you must make a vow upon the spear, the overleader 
spoke in a different voice, frightening, unearthly, and devoid of foolishness. Follow me, she commanded. Celeste had no choice. As soon as the woman floated back toward her chair, Celeste glided along behind her as if on invisible rollers. The lizard remained motionless but watchful. Behind the old chair, resting in the corner, stood a spear, its tip glowing a golden bronze against the dark wall. The overleader floated to the spear and hugged it to her chest. She floated back and held it out to Celeste, as if offering her a platter of sweets. Celeste noticed the old woman's right arm dipped slightly when she extended the spear to her. But then the mysterious weapon mesmerized her. Trance-like, she reached out to receive it. The old woman smiled a toothless, malevolent smile. The spear was lighter than it appeared and inlaid with wavy patterns of the same metal as the point. As soon as Celeste touched the cold metal, her heart constricted and her head grew fuzzy. Images of her parents reaching for her across a giant void flashed in her memory, and sorrow threatened to consume her. She re tried to release the spear, but couldn't move her hands. She tried to scream, but couldn't open her mouth. Now swear upon the spear you will never approach the big water again. The woman's voice was fiendish. Celeste was confused by the command, but with muscles inexplicably freed, she repeated it. I'll never approach the big water again, but why would I? Why would anyone? She choked back tears. The overleader responded by removing the spear from her hands, and instantly the grip of sorrow loosened slightly. Beauty, beautiful, isn't it? The overleader's dissonant voice returned as she replaced the spear in the corner. Made from orcalcum, the rarest of metals. I've never heard of it. Celeste's eyes remained transfixed on the glowing spear. Yes, it's beautiful. But she remembered what had happened when she held it and struggled to hold back tears again. The woman rubbed her right arm as if nursing an injury. She spoke in a sickly sweet tone. Here, dearie dear, you dropped this. She pulled from within her cloak a small rectangle of paper and handed it to Celeste. Without looking at it, Celeste knew what it was. Celeste Araya Nolan, the woman read before handing the slip to Celeste. Who might that be, and why would you be carrying her name across the biggy big water? So she knew. It was, it was my best friend from the other side. She gave it to me when I left so I wouldn't forget her. Celeste wondered how much longer she needed to keep her identity a secret. It didn't feel like the right time to abandon her new name, but she could tell the overleader knew exactly who she really was. Did that mean the shifter knew too? So we share a tiny secret, the overleader grinned, clasping her talon-like fingers together in mock excitement. And I will keep your secret, Palomiloma, as long as you keep your oath. Of course I will. Everyone's trying to stay away from it. That's probably why I was told to come here, to find a way to hold it back. The overleader stiffened. Should I find you've broken your oath, your little friendly friends will suffer. You think you're special, but you're not. Foolish girl, you have no control over the big water, so stay away from it. Stay away from it or my little feathered friend will see to it you never see your friends again. Now be gone. Do not return. No longer imprisoned by the overleader's power, Celeste fled to the door, which opened before she got to it. With one look over her shoulder, she saw the lizard advancing after her. She slammed the door in its face and ran to the yard where she immediately collapsed on the ground. Intense sorrow overwhelmed her, and great heaving sobs choked her.
Her head was heavy and dizzy with images of her family on the day of the event, the day she lost them. She heard the faraway rumble grow closer and the whimpering of her puppy hiding beneath the table in another room. She felt the ground heave, smelled the fear, saw the wide eyes of her parents as they reached for her and witnessed the house break apart between them. Mommy! Daddy! She called to them just as they shouted her name, reaching for her as Orville had reached for her while plummeting into the void, and with a tremendous whoop, they fell from sight. It was happening as if for the first time, and Celeste saw herself lying on the floor, clinging to the edge of the fissure and crying into the void for her parents. Sounds of cracking and crashing hurt her ears, and she gagged as she had that tragic day on the smell of rotten eggs. When her head cleared, Celeste wiped her eyes with her stained scarf. On her palms, a slight shimmer of orichalcum remained, and upon seeing it, her heart clenched again. She rubbed the metal from her hands and could breathe again, but not without feeling the lingering grief from reliving the most traumatic event in her life. She began the long walk back to the village, wondering why the despicable old woman cared so much about keeping her away from the big water. The experience with the overleader had drained her strength and shattered her confidence. Think, think, she told herself. She couldn't just fly back into the village after what they'd done to her. Who could she trust? Her heart ached when she recalled the pained expression on Nick's face. Even he had been unable to stop the others from seeing to it that she was punished for her crimes. Maddie had every reason to fear a visit to the overleader. With her head still throbbing, Celeste curled up under a bush. She wanted to hide from everything and everyone. Nothing she had done since leaving the children's home had stopped the advance of the disgusting water, and with the ground cracking again, their situation was growing bleaker by the moment. The black vulture's hiss overhead startled her from her misery. She panicked when she realized it was flying lopsidedly back toward the village, its right wing still clearly injured from its impact with the boat. Rising quickly and stumbling in her attempt to chase after the bird, she feared the old lady's power had impaired her ability to fly. She ran, gaining speed the farther she moved from the decrepit house until she heard Orville's voice calling her. Something was horribly wrong. That ends chapter 25 of book one.